Discover Calvary classes began on September the 16th, so if you don't want to go through those, uh, be sure and uh, sign up to be a part of that. Then we have a fall meeting of the association coming up at the end of the month. Then uh, we're making it fun for you to find your uh, menu for Wednesday night supper, because it was one color last week, it's a different color this week. Uh, but uh, just an emphasis on uh, the supper, please do this, uh, and you need to get these turned in by noon on Tuesday. Remember, you can do it online, you can call the church office, or you can drop this in one of the baskets and handle it in that way as well. But the uh, online sign up for Wednesday night suppers will stop at noon on Tuesday. Uh, so uh, be sure to get that in by uh, noon on Tuesday. And then we have some other folks sharing announcements with you at this time. Ladies, um, I'm here this summer still out. Uh, she had her surgery and was successful in her hoping she had a 100% recovery since she still asking for your prayers. Uh, but our secretary asked uh, someone, and I volunteered, to come up here and tell you that today is the last day to sign up for any of the ladies refresher courses. We've got some wonderful studies picked out for you. Uh, and for those of you that are new to Calvary, you don't have to be a member. You can sign up a friend and bring a friend as well. Um, and the sign up table where all the ladies table is and where all the sign ups are, watch my arms, are out that doorway and just a little bit over. Okay? So Today's the last day because the secretary needs to guarantee you a book so that you have something to work with when you get here. Um, also, Brother Van mentioned sisterhood. Just one quick thing. Sisterhood is for any lady in this house. You don't have to be a member of Calvary. We even welcome teenagers. It's for fun and um, fellowship. Okay? It's very simple get together it's so that we get a chance to, to know each other. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Uh, I'd like to let you know that this Friday night, August 31st, will be our first fifth quarter of the year. So teenagers after the football game, you're welcome to come to the gym and play games, and we'll have food for you as well. It'll be first come, first serve with the food. So get here quickly. That'll be over at midnight. Also, we'll have GAT next week. Or, I'm sorry, it'll be September 2nd, which will be next week. Um, have your money by Wednesday night, and if you're going, let me know. We had sign-ups in the youth room, but there's still a few more slots available if you'd like to go, and that's also for parents as well. And then for our small group leaders, we do have a meeting this afternoon at 4.30. I've sent out an email for that, so please, please uh, plan to be there at 4.30. And then also, we have our youth conference coming up for our parents. 
and for our youth leaders. We've got 25 people signed up right now. The price is 25 per person. I want to encourage all of you to sign up for that if you're a parent. It's not just for teenagers. It can also be very effective for people with younger children because at some point they will become teenagers. So I want to encourage all of you to sign up for that. You can see here, you can come to the church office and talk to saying And we have a video to show you this morning that kind of goes a little more into depth.
we did that, you gloriously forgave us of our sins and made us a part of your family. And Lord, we just rejoice in that wonderful truth. Lord, we do thank you for the days that we're coming out of, those days of revival and the great move of your Holy Spirit. During that time, Lord, the people that recommitted their lives to you, the folks that got saved, the folks that were renewed in spirit, dear Father, revived in heart. And Lord, we just pray that that revival will live on in our hearts and lives for years to come. Really, Lord, for all the way till we go home to be with you, dear Father. And Lord, we just ask today for the many prayer concerns and needs that have been shared with us. Ask, dear Lord, that you would just touch and bless, comfort, grief, and hearts. Just be with those, dear Lord, that are dealing with sicknesses and life trials and just a, a host of other things that this sin-filled world confronts us with, dear Father. And Lord, we just pray that you would enable them to be overcomers in the midst of that, dear Lord. Father, we just uh, pray that you'd bless in this service today, move in a mighty way by the power of the Spirit. We just ask, oh God, that you would just touch hearts here and draw people to yourself that still may be unsaved, that uh, people that need to get right with you, and Lord, just may uh, you uh, convict them by the Holy Spirit and draw them to yourself, dear Lord. Lord, rain down your Spirit in this place. And Lord, just be with us as a nation and guide us uh, as your church, Lord, that we would just make an impact in this nation and in the world. And I pray in Christ's name. Amen. So as you're being seated, we welcome you this morning. So good to see you in Calvary. Uh, if you're a guest with us, we're honored that you're here worshiping with us today. And if we ask you to do us a favor, would you please take the bulletin you received? You'll notice on that bulletin there is a tab that requests your name and uh, address and other information, contact information. And uh, also allows you to ask more information about the church. Would you please take the time to fill that in and then tear it from the bulletin and then uh, drop it in the offering plate when it passes your way in just a little while. Uh, you're offering to us today. We're so glad that you're here. We're just uh, glad to be in the house of the Lord. We were down in Sunday school a little bit this morning. Only had 287 in Sunday school. Uh, but I uh, just want to encourage you that if you were not in Sunday school, there is a place for you uh, in Sunday school. So we hope that you'll come and be a part uh, of our Sunday school. Remember, this is what you're looking for if you're filling out the Wednesday night menu. And remember, those need to be turned in by noon on Tuesday if you're planning on eating on Wednesday night. So just remember that. And then you have uh, this sheet that is telling you about Hope Night. And uh, if you're going to be a part of Hope Night tomorrow night, please take the time to fill that in uh, so we'll know how much food to prepare for the folks that are uh, coming uh, to Hope Night. Well, we had a glorious revival. The Lord moved in a mighty, mighty way. Lives were touched. Folks were sealed uh, for eternity by trusting Christ as their Lord and Savior. And other decisions were made. Uh, but I tell you, the reality of revival it is not what that concluded on Wednesday night in that final service, but it's what happened in our heart and will be manifest through us in the coming days as we live out what Jesus has done in us. Did we truly get revived? Did we truly mean the commitments that we made to the Lord? If we really did, then those will be demonstrated by our actions uh, in the coming days as we live faithfully for the Lord. But it was just a joy to have Brother Rick Corum with us and to have uh, those great days of revival. Good to see you here today. Glad that you're a part of this worship experience this morning. Stand together again if you would. This is an opportunity to greet any guests and well, as well as fellowship with one another. So move around and greet one another.
those that are bound with cancer, those sickness, diseases, the spring of being out upon them, and those that will cover for sure. Just pray for quick recoveries for their complications. Those that are just missing loved ones, that they have lost their legal freedom, just pray for the comfort upon them. Just pray for the people who receive that comfort of peace that I need to provide. Pray for the leaders of the nation. Just pray that they will seek your wisdom your guidance, that you will guide them as they make decisions for the nation and our community. Pray for public service. I pray your protection upon our police, our firemen, emergency workers, as they go about their normal jobs every day. And I pray for our military. I pray for our men and women as they harm's way overseas. I pray your protection upon them. Lord, now I just pray for these guys and all of us pray for them to be used to prevent you to reach lost souls and to give us your efforts for the lives and lives. Holy Spirit, Jesus, Amen.
great you are. That you would send your son to die in our stead to take our sins away. Lord, as we trust in that act of mercy and grace from you, dear Lord, you can cleanse us and set us free. And we just thank you so much. Father, we are grateful we are in your presence today. We know that you are here in this house. We just ask that you would move in a convicting way across the congregation to speak to hearts. We pray that there will be no distraction. We pray that there will be nothing uh, that will hinder anyone from hearing your truth and responding in obedience to you as you deal with their hearts today. Dear Father, Lord, let your spirit move free in a mighty way in this place. Accomplish what you desire. We'll praise you for us in Jesus' name. Amen. Still our theme of home improvement, I want to share or preach on the topic of parenting prodigals uh, this morning. Parenting prodigals. So you know that uh, you probably want to make your way to the 15th chapter of the Gospel of Luke to find uh, this story. The story of the prodigal is familiar in most circles. So uh, just uh, parenting prodigals in uh, Luke 15. Now I'm not going to read all 32 verses this morning, but I want to share from the opening verses of that text with you about this topic on parenting prodigals. Many have lived this story personally. There are returned or restored prodigals seated among us today. There are parents who are dealing with prodigals while I am preaching this sermon uh, this morning. And there are some that are seated here who will face having a prodigal in the future. Now it's not a question of whether you're living godly because two children can be raised in, in the same home and one will walk with the Lord and the other will pursue the pleasures of the world. So, so that is not the thing. Yet there are many parents who live with the guilt of their child being a prodigal. And some of those parents have almost uh, put themselves in an early grave due to having a wayward child. And a lot of that guilt and a lot of that concern regarding prodigals has grown out of this particular passage of Scripture. They look at that and they say, train up the child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Now, many parents with prodigals, they begin to think and they begin to say, uh, well, if I'd train my child up in the way that he should go or she should go, uh, then they would not be doing this. Evidently, I failed. It is what they are thinking uh, in their mind. So, so they're thinking, I obviously uh, did not get this across to them. But they still hold on to the latter part of the verse. When he is old, uh, he will not depart from it. And they, they hang on to that uh, with the thought that my child, even though uh, they have gone out, they become a prodigal, one day they are going to come home. And, and let me say this to you. Many claim this as a promise, but Proverbs are not promises. I want you to understand that. Proverbs are not promises. So many want to claim that as a promise, but a proverb is not a promise. I sought out several ways to try to explain what a proverb was, and the best uh, illustration or explanation or definition uh, to me was the one given by Adrian Rogers when he said a proverb is a general principle that when generally applied will bring a general result. He was just uh, saying that you can't do that. In fact, Dr. Rogers went on and said, if you read the book of Proverbs and try to turn Proverbs into promises, you will lose your faith. He said a proverb is a proverb, a promise is a promise, a precept is a precept, a parable is a parable, and a prophecy is a prophecy. You have to be careful how you take the word and claim that word. 
But when we look at this and give consideration to this this morning, like I said, there are many different situations. Return prodigals, uh, you know what it is to be in the far country and to come back home and be right with your parents. Or you know what it is to be in the far country away from God and come back home and be right with Him. Some are seated, going right through. You're right in the thick of it. You're just wondering. You're struggling. You're battling. You're trying to hold on to everything uh, that you can to get you through uh, this time of having a wayward uh, child in your life. And uh, so when we look at this today, and and we look at this text in in Luke chapter 15, and I want to begin in verse 1 and read through about verse 7 as we look at it this morning, and I share with you uh, on this topic, because I want to talk to you about reaching out to your prodigal and rescuing your prodigal and and rejoicing uh, when, if your prodigal comes home. But it begins, Then all the tax collectors and sinners drew near to him to hear him. And the Pharisees and scribes complained, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. Now that was disturbing to them that uh, the tax collectors uh, and the sinners were eating with Jesus. The religious of that day could not uh, believe that. But I'm glad Jesus sat with sinners, aren't you? I mean, if he hadn't sat with sinners, I'd be left out. But because he did, and because he came and died for sinners, then that brings us in to the family of God. Now, I want you to note the way that verse 3 is written when you come to it, though. So he spoke this parable to them, saying. So he spoke this, notice that, this parable to them, saying. Now, what we typically do is we, we jump down to verse 11. And that's the story of the prodigal. We start at 11 and go through the rest of the chapter uh, to read about the prodigal. And we skip over uh, what he gave. But he said he gave this parable to them. Then he told the parable of the lost sheep, or the story of the lost sheep, rather. Then he told the story of the lost coin. Then he told the story of the lost or prodigal son. But he gave it all in one parable is what this is saying uh, to us. So note verse 4 through 7 with me. What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he loses one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one which is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. And I say to you that likewise there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine just persons who need no repentance. Now, of course, you could, uh, in the context of this, uh, we look at this, and very naturally, those Pharisees are, who are complaining about him eating uh, with tax collectors and sinners, uh, this is a, a direct thrust at them that they uh, really stand in need of salvation. So, so that, that is the, the context of what he is saying to us. But let me share this with you this morning on parenting prodigals. And I want to share those things with you and hope that they will be a help to you if you are dealing with a prodigal or if you've been one or if someday in the future you have to deal with one. But I want to begin by talking about reach out to our prodigals. Reach out to our prodigals. In verse 4, it says, What man has a hundred sheep, will he not leave ninety-nine in the wilderness and go for the one lost sheep, for the one uh, that has gone astray. Uh, Will he not go and look for it till he finds it? So so naturally, the thought is that if we have a prodigal or if one of our children wanders off in a wayward way out into the world, there is a natural desire in us that we want to reach out and, and rescue those children that we want to reach out to them, that we want to go after them, and we want to bring them back. And one of the reasons that that is so prominent in our heart is due to the fact of the jeopardy of being a prodigal. 
there is jeopardy in being a prodigal. And I, I want to give you some things uh, regarding this. If, the, if you are a prodigal right now, uh, this is where you are. You are in jeopardy, and you need to understand that, uh, that this is where you find yourself. And the first thing that I would say to you is that prodigals are defenseless. Now notice, we're talking about sheep here. He said, the man had 100 sheep, 99 he left. He goes after the one that has wandered off. Now, now sheep are defenseless animals. If you've ever watched sheep, you will notice, other than sometimes them maybe butting heads with one another, there are no defense mechanisms about them, really. They have no way to defend themselves. They are slow, so slow, they, they can't even run from the dangers uh, that come their way. Uh, they are absolutely defenseless. And uh, so uh, we find that to be true. And that's true of a prodigal. That, that, that is true of those who wander away from the faith, get away uh, from the teachings of their parents uh, about how uh, to live godly. They, they get out into the world and they really have no defense uh, against all of the things that Satan throws at them. Satan begins to lure them this way and draw them in this direction and tell them all the pleasure that would be found in this. And, and, and they cannot put up a defense against it. They cannot say why this is wrong and, and I don't need to be involved in that. They become defenseless and they cannot uh, escape the deceitful desires of sin that are luring them into rebellion and luring them uh, out into the world. They, they just have no defense to it. Or even if they've been equipped with it, they neglect those things and they become defenseless, choosing not to use those. So they are uh, defenseless. But also, uh, prodigals are directionless as well. Sheep have no sense of direction whatsoever. You can release a carrier pigeon and they'll find their way home. Uh, now how many stories have you heard about dogs who have wandered off and they made their way back home? And, and we've even watched Disney movies about dogs that wandered back home after uh, being away. I mean, gone for miles and miles, a long way for them. They come back home, but sheep don't have that. Sheep are directionless. They, they don't know how uh, to get back home. They, they, they just don't do it. They don't know. They, just, they have their head down looking for that next little tuft of grass and, and whatever it is, and they're off. And before you know it, they, they don't know where they are, and they don't even know uh, how to get back home because they are absolutely directionless. And that is the same thing with many prodigals. They are directionless. In fact, uh, they get out there and they get caught up in these things and they get out in the world and they, they just began to think, I can't go home. I can't go home. I don't know how to go back home. How could I ever go back home? Look at what I've done. Look at the, this and look at that. And they just don't know how uh, to go back home. And they begin to believe that they can go back home. In fact, they begin to think uh, that uh, they've created too many barriers uh, because of the things they've done and the hurt they've caused that they, uh, they are blocked and they, they have no direction of how to get back home. They don't know where to turn. They don't know when to turn. And they don't know how to turn in order to get back home because they're out in the world. And that's why uh, that we need to reach out uh, to them and let them know. But another truth about uh, prodigals is uh, in their jeopardy is not only are they defenseless and directionless, but they're in danger as well. Sheep are surrounded by dangers when they wander from the fold. Sheep, when they get out of the fold, they're, they're, uh, they're wild animals that are a threat to them and want to devour them. They, they don't even know what to eat. They don't even realize that some of the shrubs and, and things around them are poisonous and, and can uh, do them harm. They're, they're not even aware that even the very elements uh, of the weather and those kind of things uh, and the elements of nature are a danger to their well-being. And the same thing is true with prodigals. Uh, when, when they get away and they begin to move out, they subject themselves to great danger because they have chosen to wander off and, and get away. 
And, and listen, listen, what they have done, what really puts them in grave danger is they have removed themselves from their parents' protection over them. And it puts them in grave danger. They're, they're out there. And, and let me tell you, the devil is a dangerous prey and he's ready to pounce on you and to devour you. Now he will promise you all kind of pleasure if you'll just rebel and get out and live this wasteful life. And that's really what prodigal means, is wasteful. If you'll just get out and live this wasteful life, then man, you'll have all kind of pleasure. But let me tell you what the real pleasure is. The real pleasure is that Satan's going to be happy when he destroys you. That's what the real pleasure is for him. But now, let me give you another thing under this uh, about how, reaching out to your prodigal, and that is the journey to find the prodigal. Uh, now, notice this. Did you notice uh, that it said that what man of you? It didn't say what shepherd of you. It said what man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he loses one, will not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go seek the one. So, so notice that, and I, I put these up this way, man, I, I just put that up, man went after his straying sheep. And I, and I believe the man is symbolic of moms and dads uh, who will go after their wayward children. They, they will go after them. There is such a burden in our hearts to have our prodigal brought back home. We will do what we can to bring them home. This is the natural desire of a loving parent. You, you're going after them. You pursue them. Uh, you, you're, you're out there. You pursue them with the hope that they will come home. You go out to do that. But I believe also when this man went looking for the one lost sheep, it was an act of mercy as well uh, when he went out to do that. And as parents, if you have a prodigal right now, show them mercy. The Heavenly Father showed us mercy. And we need to show mercy to our children. Now, I've, got, I've given you that word uh, that we ought to show them mercy. But now listen to me. Listen to this next statement I'm about to make to you now. Understand this. Your child is responsible for their decision to be a prodigal. Now, understand that. Your child is responsible for their decision to be a prodigal. Now, they may want to blame you. They may want to blame others for their wayward behavior. They may want to do all of those things. And you need to still show them mercy. And you show them mercy by loving them in their rebellion, not by condoning or enabling them in their rebellion. Did you hear me? You love them in the rebellion, but you're not condoning what they're doing. You're not enabling them to keep living on in that waywardness that they are living in. You're not showing them mercy if you're doing that, if you're enabling them. You're not helping them in the least. And the other word that I have under that is, is the word manner. And notice, he went, he found that sheep, uh, and he searched to it uh, till he finds it, uh, is what uh, the scripture says. Then, then you will do what you can to find your prodigal. Now, in this storyline, the sheep is brought home, and that's great. That's not always the case with a prodigal. They're not always brought home. Just because you find them does not mean that they will return. And I mean, there have been many mothers and fathers. They've sought out their prodigal. They've shown mercy to them, and still they return home empty-handed. And here again is the reason you've got to understand this. The prodigal is responsible for his or her actions and decisions. So understand that. You've got to, uh, you've got to remember that. You're showing them mercy. You want to go and find them and you want to bring them back home. You want to do that. You want to do what is my next point, which is you want to rescue your prodigal. We want to rescue our prodigals. But let me tell you, you cannot rescue a prodigal that does not want to be rescued. You cannot do it. 
Now, now you may try to force them to return, but if their heart is still rebellious, until they are willing to own up to their rebellion, you will not rescue them. Now listen to me. You will not rescue them even if they are living under your own roof. Now understand that. Because listen, the, if you get down to chapter, verse 11 and you read about the prodigal son, it said he went to a far country, but there is nothing given about how far that far country was. And listen, a sheep doesn't have to wander very far to be out of the fold and in grave danger and defenseless and, and directionless. And a prodigal doesn't have to go far either. So understand that. But now let me read verse 5 to you. And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. In the shoulders, I saw some pictures uh, of some wonderful truths in dealing uh, with prodigals. Now, parenting your prodigals is what I'm talking uh, to you about. And these are single words that I want to give to you. The first one is the word prayer. When, when I thought about this, th this uh, man put that sheep up on his shoulders. Now, in the Old Testament, the high priest wore an ephod. And when he went into the tabernacle or when he went into the temple, uh, he had up on his shoulders, uh, he had stones on his shoulders uh, representing the 12 tribes of the children of Israel. And when he went into the tabernacle, he was praying for them. He was interceding for them. So uh, that was what they were doing. Let me tell you this. Prayer is the most powerful uh, weapon you have in your arsenal to rescue your prodigal. Understand that. Pray for them. Pray for them. And, and I mean uh, really get uh, serious about praying for them. And, and understand this. Sometimes the only way that you can parent your children is by prayer. Understand that. that that's the only way that you can do it. Now, now, you have to be genuine in heart. You have to be serious. You have to be right with God. And you're crying out. Then you can rescue them. And besides that, I know people who have prayed their prodigals home. They've been able to see them come home. Second word that came to my mind when I thought about shoulder was peace. Can you imagine that, that sheep was out in the wilderness, lost, wandering around, maybe all tangled, matted, uh, uh, you, know, just, you, you know, just gone through a lot of fear, a lot of things going on. Can you imagine the peace when that man put that sheep up on his shoulders? The peace. Now, now just, just think uh, about this. The shoulder is a wonderful place of peace. If you don't think so, just think about this. How many times has your child or your grandchild crawled up into your lap and laid their head on your shoulder? Why? Because it's a place of peace. It's a place of comfort. It's a place to be. So when you're rescuing your child and, and you're praying for them and they're coming home, uh, you know, give them a place of peace. In fact, the prodigal doesn't realize it, but a godly home is the place of peace. That is the place to come, to find it. Another word that I had under this is the word power. The word power. And when you think about power, just picture that shepherd. I don't know how, how big this sheep was, but just picture this. Hoisting that sheep up on his shoulder. What a picture of power. Uh, that is, as he lays that sheep up on his shoulder and around him. Now here again, uh, let me just do a little bit of family thing. How many of you fathers have reached down or heard your kid run up to you and say, Daddy, tote me on your shoulders. And you pick him up or her up and you set them up on your shoulders and, and you tote them around, you know they're up high and boy they think they're, they're something up there, you, you know. But you know why? It's a place of power. It's a place of protection. Oh, give them a place of protection. Realize God has the power to rescue your child and bring them home to you. And when God breaks them and they come home and they're returning home, give them a strong shoulder on which to lean. Welcome them. Welcome them back. And one other word under rescuing your prodigal, and that would be permanence. Permanence. Oh, what a scene of permanence uh, this is. Shepherd hoisted that sheep up on his shoulder, and, and he, he probably took the legs and brought the legs down around, and, and he held uh, the legs 
and he's taking that sheep back to the fold. Oh, can you imagine the sense of security, the sense of permanence uh, that sheep feels when, when that one has come out and brought him back home? I, I mean, we want our families and should make our families permanent places of protection and peace for those who have wandered away. We want them to come back. We want our families together. We want it. So prayer and peace and power and permanence as a part uh, of rescuing uh, your prodigal. And then let me give you the third point in this, and that would be rejoice over our prodigals. Rejoice over our prodigals. Notice what verse 6 said. When he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I found my sheep which was lost. Oh, there was great joy over finding this sheep. And there will be great celebration and great joy over a prodigal coming home. So, so what happens? Now notice uh, what happened there. One thing is there was sharing in the rejoicing. There was sharing in the rejoicing. Notice uh, it, it said that he called together his friends and neighbors. So there is sharing in the rejoicing. So uh, that tells us there is joy in the home. Joy in the home. Oh, you'll want to invite your neighbors over. You'll want to call up church members and say, hey, my prodigal daughter, my prodigal son, they came home. Uh, you'll want them to rejoice. You know, we're told to weep with those who weep, rejoice with those who rejoice. And when a prodigal comes home, we ought to rejoice with them. Joy uh, in the home over the return of a wayward child. That, that ought to take place. But let me tell you this. Even in the joy of a prodigal coming home, there is still a time of, uh, of adjustment as the prodigal settles back down into the routine of family life. So understand that. Joy in the home, but there may be some adjustment pains going on while it's all settled back. But, uh, but let me tell you something else. It's not only joy in the home, but there's joy in heaven. Joy in heaven over it. Did you, you notice that? Uh, that it said, uh, saying, Rejoice me, or found that. And then, then in verse 7, I say unto you likewise, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 just persons who need no repentance. There will be joy in heaven because the wayward child has come home. Listen, heaven rejoices when those who live in rebellion get right with the Lord. That is exactly what happens. Whether it's a wayward child coming home, a sinner getting saved, a backslider getting right with God, whatever it is, there's joy in heaven because sin has been going on in the life. And I've been preaching all year long on this home improvement thing, and I still believe God gets excited when homes are repaired and families are restored. I really believe there's joy in heaven. But now, let me give you one other thing before I close. And I believe this is true, that it's in the text. I believe it's in that seventh verse. Uh, and I want you to notice this. There's stipulation in rejoicing. There is stipulation in rejoicing. Now, notice that. Because verse 7, it said, I say unto you, likewise, there shall be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents. Over one sinner who repents. Listen, there has to be true repentance in the heart of the prodigal for there to be a true joy in the return. There has to be true repentance in the heart of the prodigal for there to be true joy in the return. Have to have repentance. Now, I know we don't like to talk about repentance today. We don't like to preach repentance today. But Jesus came preaching repentance to enter the kingdom of heaven and we need to preach repentance and what repentance is repentance is turning from a stage of rebellion to one of obedience it is what is happening so this this prodigal is not oh man i don't have any money i don't have any of this i, I just want to get back home i'm still going to be as rebellious as i ever was but 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 i just want to get back to the comforts there where I can be rebellious in a more comfortable way, that's not going to bring joy in the return. 
There has to be repentance. And this means the wanderer admits they're wrong and desires to live differently. There's a real change in the attitude and action on the part of the prodigal for there to be true joy at the return. It's got to be. Jesus said it in that particular passage, it has to be true. Well, as I conclude and extend the invitation uh, this morning, if you're a prodigal, I invite you to come home today. Now that could mean that you are a believer who has strayed from the Lord and you need to come home to Him. You're just away from the Lord. You say, well, I know I got saved when I was young and I, I really believe that Jesus died for the ungodly. I trusted that. Jesus saved me and, and I, I know I'm saved. I put my absolute trust and faith in Him and, and I know I'm a child of God, but you're away from God. You're not living like you ought to. You're in some sin right now. You're being disobedient to God in some area of your life right now. And, and you're a prodigal. You're away from the Father. You need to come home. You're living in rebellion. You're wasting your life. You're not being all God wants you to be. You need to be coming home. And you need to do it today. And today would be the day to do that. I, there may be that the simple fact that there is a child who is a prodigal who is estranged from your parents today and you need to get things right with them and like I said you may not have wandered very far into the far country you may still be under the same roof but you know you're estranged from your parents you're rebelling rebelling against everything that they're wanting you to do and you're saying well I, I and you may still say well preacher I, I'm a child of God you can't live that way and be right with God you just need to understand that and then there's another application uh, to a prodigal, and I believe uh, that is a sinner who has wasted your life living sinfully, and God has found you today by his convicting power. Uh, he has convinced you that you're lost, that you need to be saved, and you need to cease living a wasteful, sinful life. And you need to come to the Savior today. Now, that's the invitation. Uh, and you need to respond in obedience if God has dealt with your heart. Bow your heads and close your eyes as we prepare to sing. You heard the invitation. Is God dealing with you? Will you respond to him? Father, we thank you for the day. We just thank you for the truth of your word. And I, I just pray, dear God, that you would move in this time of invitation to grip hearts, to draw people to you. Some may need to get saved, Lord. Some families may need to do some restoration. Some believers may need to come home to you, Lord. They are living a wasteful life because they're not living obediently. And some are just trapped in sin, Lord. Wasting their lives in sin because they've never realized that you loved them so much that Jesus died for them on the cross. Lord, may they come to you in simple, honest belief and trust today and be saved, dear Lord. Father, but you move in this invitation time, and I pray it in Christ's name. Amen. Stand as we sing.
seen it lighter and that they are coming and they are coming by statement because they're coming from the Methodist church, I believe that's all on their part. But they have been immersed and they have been, I uh, know they're saved, been immersed and they've been through membership classes, so I I present them to you as members of Calvary. <laughs> see all of these folks, but this is Marv and Maggie Yoder, and uh, they come, and they've been saved, but they've never been scripturally baptized, so they come uh, with a desire to be baptized uh, today, and uh, knowing that they're saved, and they've been through membership classes, and after they're baptized, we will make them official members of the church as well, and uh, hold on, they've got Hank, and and we've got Stevie here. Now, Hank and Stevie called me after church Wednesday night. And they both told me that they believed that they were sinners. And they told me that they had sinned. They believed that Jesus died on the cross for their sins and rose from the dead. And they believed in that to save them. And so they won't be baptized too. So that, that's Hank and Stevie. <laughs> Now, here's a young man that's kind of special to me. And uh, he said, I had to say this because he wouldn't do it. But after church, uh, Wednesday night on the way home, Bryson started asking questions of his mom and dad about what uh, Brother Rick preached that night. And I think, so, why do we say folks would leave their clothes on? Why, why do you know all the things he preached in that rapture sermon? And they said, well, we'll get home and we'll talk about it. And then a little later that night, Anna and I got to enjoy FaceTiming with him and him telling us that Jesus saved him that night. And so we were really blessed to have a great time. We said, all of y'all out front, uh, where folks can come by and speak to you and, and tell you how proud they are of the decisions you made and welcome you uh, here at Calvary as well. So, so that's, that's a joy. But my wives, would you come uh, to lead us in our closing prayer? Uh, Brother Michael is making his way uh, tonight at 6 o'clock. Brother Mark is going to be preaching tonight. So I only invite you to come here. Brother Mark is going to be uh, preaching tonight. Remember Hope Night. Uh, remember those other things. And I know some of the men went to uh, Bill Wilhelm of the Men's Conference, and uh, I just want to make something known to all the men here, and, and that is you can get the Real Momentum app on, on your phone, and you can actually uh, hear the messages that we heard that were preached at Emmanuel, if, if you men would like to uh, take note of that. And I'm going to make an announcement to some of you men in regard to this, my son texted me right at the beginning of the service. Pastor Johnny Hunt resigned Woodstock Church this morning. He has already announced his replacement. And my understanding is he's going with the North American Mission Board to serve with them. So I knew some of you men would probably be asking me about that if I'd heard that 